What's up, everybody? I hope, uh, you know, I hope you guys can hear me. I hope you guys can see me. I have been having the worst problems with my setup, and I cannot explain why. I have tried everything. I uh, had an interview I had to do today uh, that I tried to record on this software. It didn't work. Uh, so if you're on, let me know if you can hear me, and let me know if you can see me. I, I came on extra early just because I wanted to, uh, I don't want, I, I want Dr. Tim Brown and Dr. Lee Altenberg to, to uh, come on and not have any glitches because I think they have a lot to say. I think a lot, oh gosh, Patsy's on. Patsy's on. How are you, Patsy? Uh, and, and she's cooking dinner too at the same time. So, well, it's good to hear all is good. Uh, I'm, I'm excited. I see Liz from YouTube. I see uh, AOK Mel. Perfect. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I'm excited. It's working. Uh, I, there's no lag. Oh, my God. I had to reschedule my interview today because I could not get this thing to work. Um, I, I did everything I possibly could. and but uh, So while we wait for the doctors to come on, I thought it would be fun to uh, open up the chat window here. Uh, let's see. Boom. And oh, right on, Alyssa. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, I, you know, I, I upgraded my system. So now all the comments are going to pop up on the screen. Oh, I look handsome tonight. Oh, my gosh. <laughs> that is classic. That is so classic. Nalani Brun. Oh, my gosh. I haven't seen you in a while. It, you know, I got to tell you, I love this platform because we get to see, well, not really see, but you know what I mean? We get to see you guys uh, that we don't normally see or talk to. So um, there we go. Linda. Hi, Linda. Jane and Dave. Who else is on here? Let me hold on. Let me scroll through this thing here. Uh, we got Janelle, our faithful Janelle. Always on. I don't think she's missed an episode. Uh, who else is on here? Josh Green responsible for Adam. <laughs> I don't know about that. Uh, but yeah, it's it's. Uh, so anyway, as your comments are showing up on the screen, so you guys all can see this, the comments, uh, I want you guys to punch in your New Year's resolutions while we wait for the doctors to come on. By the way, Happy New Year. Happy New Year. Uh, yeah, I'm, I'm real curious and anxious to see. Uh, and I know we're very early. We got about 12 minutes or so. So pop in your your new year's resolutions if you have i i stopped making them because i could never uh eat healthy oh okay that's that's my wife well uh you know i eat what you cook nalani says mine is simple let me go i'm gonna have some fun tonight what the heck let's put them out here patsy says eat healthy nalani says simplify easier said than done but i you know i tell you what that that could be that could be mine that could be mine uh, Janelle says, try to be kinder to others, especially in traffic. That's hard. That's hard to do. Uh, as, as you know, it's, it's really difficult. Uh, awesome, guys. Thank you. Thank you for chiming in. This is, this, is, this is what it's supposed to be like. Have realistic expectations. Awesome. <laughs> uh, Laurel says, my New Year's resolution is not to make any resolutions. All right. Jane says, sleep more. You know, I, I got I to gotta share the story. I know you guys all know of the Buffalo Bills player that got hurt cardiac arrest middle of the field right after making a tackle and i i gotta tell you i was i, I felt really bad i was really sad um you know i we've seen many injuries over the years watching football uh nothing like what we saw there but you know what happened afterwards and i think this goes to to the comment about being nice to people Janelle's comment of being being kind to people. What I saw after that between the Bengals and the Bills, uh, you know, they were competitors. They were they showed up that day to beat each other up. A uh, lot on the line, and and they, what I saw afterwards, uh, you know, the crying and the hugging, and you know, it didn't matter. You know, it, so much emphasis put on racism and all of that stuff. But what we saw was a bunch of brothers sisters because there are there are a lot of wahine uh, on these teams in the support roles but what you saw was so much 
love. And that should really be a message for us going into the new year. Uh, it, it's, it's nice to see the player is, is progressing. He's still in critical condition. Uh, Sam, you lost the show? I, I, Sam, I don't know what's, what's wrong. You know, it seems like you're always losing. I'm not sure. You might want to reboot your computer. I don't know. Uh, is anyone else having issues? Let me know. Put them in the comments. Uh, yeah, it, you know, yeah, humans, Janelle. That, that's exactly right. Human beings that were competitors, fierce competitors. And uh, but uh, no, nobody, nobody has issues. Awesome. But it, it just goes to show. Number one, life is short, guys. Yeah, life is short. You never know what's what's going to happen. Um, but more importantly, was the love that uh, they, the, the love that they had, or have, for each other. Uh, that should be the foundation for all of us as we move forward in 2023. Um, they really should, because we we don't have to agree with each other 100% of the time. But we we still got to respect and love each other, and, and I think that's that was. I think the biggest takeaway I had from that horrific day, one that I'll never forget. And, and uh, you know, and, and I'm sure many of you, if you did watch, I think you feel the same way. Um, let me see here. What let me see here. I cannot watch on TV and my iPad at the same time. So I use Facebook on one and YouTube on another. Awesome. Uh, <laughs> no matter what I t tap, the mad face shows up. Oh gosh. You know, uh, we're, we're gonna real quick just because you said you mentioned that I you know I've been doing a podcast we've had we dropped one episode and you can find me on all on Apple Spotify Google all, all of the, the the top podcast channels go ahead and just look up Facebook I'm oh, sorry feed my mind with uh, Mel Raposo and you know we've I've interviewed a bunch of people already we dropped the episodes on every Wednesday morning but uh, the interview that I did today, or I tried to do today, we had to reschedule because everything screwed up. But uh, Ed Snyder, he's a pastor, but he wrote a book, and he talks about being a very angry person for over 40 years and finally learned how to overcome it. And I cannot wait uh, for that for, for that interview to happen and, and that podcast to drop because he, uh, the short discussion that we did have today. He, he was uh, he's a funny guy uh, been through so much in life so uh, yes rip Danny Kalekini um, unfortunately he passed away today uh, peacefully they say uh, but what a what a what an icon for our state uh, for for our world really um, yeah so unfortunately he did pass away I was trying to find a I took a picture with him once at the state capitol many many years ago and I was trying to find that picture uh, to post but I couldn't find it but that guy is a genuine statesman, the ambassador of Aloha, and uh, he definitely will be missed. Um, the guy looked healthy as an ox. Uh, but yeah, uh, condolences out to, to the Ohana. Um, he, he definitely will be missed. But yeah, so guys, go check it out. Go check out the, the podcast. Uh, I, I, I put up one episode on the YouTube channel. I know a lot of you watch those, uh, watch that one. Uh, I'm debating whether or not I'm going to split between YouTube and the podcast. I know a lot of people not familiar with podcasting, but if, if you go to uh, Apple Podcasts or uh, I wish I could, let me see if I can get the link here. Hold on. I'll, I'll post the link. Well, I'm going to have to do it. I'll do it later. I'll put it in the comments later so you guys will, you guys will see it. I'll put it up in my page as well. But yeah, just go and check it out. It's, it's, it's really cool. The one I have up on right now is, uh, uh, what the heck was her first name now? Dickinson was her last name. She might be watching. I'm embarrassed. Uh, but she, we spoke on mental health and bipolar uh, disorder. She was a caregiver for her mom. But I got to tell you that this interviews that I've done, I think I've done four so far. Uh, yeah, it comes up on LinkedIn. It's, it's everywhere. It's everywhere. <laughs> yeah, listen in the car. That's the way. You know, I think the podcast is probably more... Uh, I, it's easier to absorb because you're not distracted by the video and, you know, you just listen. So we're, we're, we're testing it out and we'll see how it goes. But I really enjoy doing them. Uh, I really enjoy doing them. And, and uh, hopefully you guys can all jump over there and, and uh, 
I don't know, I think it's subscribe or like or whatever the page uh, or the, the podcast. And then whenever on Wednesdays, you'll get a reminder. But I can tell you, you will not be disappointed. These, these people are professional podcasters that I, I get off of a, a directory. Uh, that's all they do. And and the information is incredible. Uh, next Monday, I interview this guy. Uh, he's a clown. Uh, he's a clown. And he he goes around the country and talk, do talks on, on uh, he's called Bullseye the Clown. And he does talks on bullying and how, how we can all, you know, stop bullying. Um, so I'm excited to talk to these guys and it's people that I've, I've never really met before. And uh, I do a lot of research on them before we do the interview. So I, I, at least I have something to talk about. Um, but interesting people from all over the country and, and um, yeah, hopefully you guys give it a shot, check it out. Uh, you might get addicted to podcasts, I don't know, but that's the intent is to just, again, put out content that is usable and entertaining and, and all of that. So uh, looking forward to having you guys join us on the podcast. And it's called Feed Your Mind because that's exactly what it is. That I was brainstorming one day and when my son and I was talking about starting a podcast and, and we it was going to be called Behind the Scenes. And then um, as we as we started to talk more, I think, no, you know, I, I want something more catchy and, and there's a ton of Feed Your Mind podcasts out there. So I, mine is Feed Your Mind with Mel Raposo. So you can just go to Apple, Google, uh, Spotify, uh, or, you know, you, you can catch them on our YouTube channel as well. I, I don't want to spoil the audio podcast by posting the video podcast. So that's kind of the dilemma I'm in right now. So let me know what you guys, what do you guys prefer? You guys prefer the video, the YouTube and the Facebook lives or... Well, if you haven't even listened to the podcast, and and I guess you really cannot answer yet, so go check it out. Go check it out. I'll have the link up later. I can't do it right now, uh, but I'll definitely put it up. And uh, feed your mind on God's word. God no lie, like man does. Ah, you know that is correct. You know that is correct. And I, I was well, I was looking so forward to today's interview with the pastor because. You know, you know what is interesting? We go back to the football story. You know, the whole world, you look, Twitter blew up, Facebook blew up, every social media platform blew up. Uh, and, and what were everyone saying? What were everyone asking for? They were asking for, uh, <laughs> I lose it listening to podcasts. Um, they were asking for prayers. I believe in prayer. I believe in the power of prayer. We've seen it happen here on our show over the last three years. The prayer circles work. And uh, but it was interesting how the whole world stopped. Everybody stopped and said, hey, pray, let's pray. All the sportscasters on uh, ESPN and all the sports shows, they, they, they weren't ashamed to ask everyone to pray. And it's interesting how when a celebrity and, and I really just anyone that is popular or, you know, once they hit something happens to them, you know, the whole world starts asking for prayer and and then when everything is uh, th it's not like that uh then people get condemned for praying it's it's really bizarre i prefer youtube so i can play on tv and let family out on manai <laughs> oh auntie millie i prefer seeing you uh we'll still the facebook live will still be on on facebook and on youtube and, and all of them uh you know, we're not going to, again, like I said, I was not going to stop the Facebook Live. The podcast is just another project, another hobby. So, yeah, we'll still maintain the Facebook Live. Again, it's, you know, it's finding in interesting people to come on and speak and share because that, that's what makes it enjoyable. You could not listen to me for a whole hour. You would, you would leave. <laughs> you really would. So... Uh, we just want to put out the best content for you guys, and, and that's what we have tonight. We have Dr. Altenberg and Dr. Brown. Dr. Tim Brown was on Spotlight, the Star Advertiser Spotlight today. I was too busy. I wasn't able to watch it. So, uh, you know, I am just as eager to hear from him as you all are. And, uh, you know, Dr. Lee Altenberg, always uh, a genius with his information and charts and, and all of that. So uh, I, I'm hoping that they'd pop on. Uh, this was supposed to happen last night. It, it got rescheduled, uh, and um, so I'm, I'm looking for a really good show, really good show. I'll, I'll turn off the chat here. I mean, I see you guys. You guys like the chat on there or not? 
Um, you know, I, I every so often, uh, prayer works. Hamlin and his family know God. A absolutely. Uh, absolutely. Uh, Mr. I don't know how you say your last name. Taven, Tavin, Tavan. But yeah, uh, it, it does. And I think that is living proof that it does. And, uh, you know, not to minimize what those medical personnel did on the field, the coach that did the CPR. Uh, everybody complained about the nine minutes it took for the ambulance and how, why did the ambulance drive out slowly? And, you know, people are so quick to criticize when they don't know what the hell is going on. You know, uh, I don't know how many of you have uh, ridden in the back of an ambulance with a patient in there. I have, and I can tell you, uh, when they are stabilizing the patient, and starting to put in the IV, and they don't need a, a uh, ambulance that is speeding and bumping. Yeah, I mean, I, it's just amazing how our society has just looking for a reason to be mad and criticize, and uh, it's just amazing. So anyway, all right, Dr. Altenberg is in. Let me bring him in here because that tells me that the system is working now it, it's when i hear his voice i will be even happier when i say my voice i will be even happier <laughs> okay. okay all right all right doc thank you i was just sharing with the villagers earlier uh i don't know why i've been having issues with this system and uh, hmm. it was I, don't, I bought, I, I, I upgraded my system and everything was working so well. I was having so much fun. The quality of the sound was better. Everything, everything was better. And then the last few days, it's just, I'm not sure if it's, it, it, it can't be my computer. I, the internet's fine. So anyway, uh, Mel, uh, I'm kind of soft. Okay, hold on. Is everyone, am I too soft people? Let me know. I can, I can raise the volume. I can raise the volume. Is it better now? Doc, can you hear me okay? Yeah, I can hear you fine. Okay. All right. All right. Uh, let me see. I, I, up. Okay. So let me know if I'm too soft, people. Let me know. Okay, I'm good. I'm good. I'm good. All right. All right. All right. Anyway, Doc, are we waiting for Dr. Tim Brown? Come on. Uh, how are you doing? Happy New Year. Happy New Year. Thank you. I'm how, how, how's it? Oh, the volume really? has been low. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Let me see. Let me, let me get him up a little bit. How's my volume? Oh, you're 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 fine. Um, okay. So yeah, I'm hoping that I'm hoping that you guys can hear me okay. Uh, maybe I gotta come closer to the mic. I don't know. Yeah. Yeah. I uh, I have a new mic and um, it's a different mic, but it it uh, it's supposed to be much better for for these types of things. So, but if you can hear me okay, and the majority of the people can hear me okay. Uh, Solid. How's everything on Oahu, my friend? Hey, go to go to the go close to the microphone again and say, "This is KMEO." This is KMEL Radio. Thank you for joining us. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Yeah, I, I I can actually now I got see I'm I'm copying you, Doc. Now I got the headphones. I can actually hear myself, and and uh, it's supposed to be uh, what you guys are hearing. So I'm hearing myself pretty good. So I'm, I'm assuming I'm, I'm okay. Let me know guys. I know, um, Desi is saying my volume is low. Is anyone else? Oh, Janelle says I'm good. So, oh, somebody else said I'm, oh, Kiala said I'm soft too. Hmm. Oh, well, I can, I can put them up louder, but I don't want to put it up louder. What's up, Mara? What is up? So a lot of a uh, lot of things going on, Doc, uh, just around the country, around the world. Uh, and you know, as, as soon as Dr. Brown gets on, we'll, we'll start the discussion on COVID. I, I saw an article come out yesterday about the wastewater, and, and and in fact, on the news tonight, they were saying that the numbers across the country, the that are being the COVID numbers, that COVID numbers that are across the country that have been uh, found in wastewater is quadruple the number of the cases that oh. are being reported through testing um and uh that is interesting and and i'd love to hear your perspective on that uh, uh so i didn't see that latest data so when you say quadruple the cases they must be talking about the the growth rate because you you can't tell how many cases are producing a given amount of 
the viral RNA in the wastewater. I was trying but, to figure but out. You can how tell they... relative ups and downs. Yeah, I was thinking, well, do they separate the duru from the households and be able to tell, you know, who got positive? But yeah, I think, I I think mean, it was. I think it was the, potentially. The, <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, my Lord. Um, it's soft, not the normal volume. Okay, hang on, folks. Let me try this. Uh, does it get better as I push this button up? Can you? Does it get louder as I push this button up? I think this might be just for my headphones. Uh, how does it sound now? Is it sound? Does it sound any different, Doc? Or does it sound the same? So, sounds to me no, the same. Okay, yeah. hold on then. So that's the wrong button. Let me try this one here. How's it now? Can you hear me now? Is it? Yeah. Uh, no, wait. Well, when you get closer to the mic, it gets louder. Okay. No change. No change. Hold on here. Let me try something else here. Auto. I appreciate you guys being so patient with me because yeah, this this is a dynamic mic, so it actually is designed oh. to be closer. Uh -huh. well, what happened now? Is it? Now I'm gonna have to. Now I'm gonna have to scoop down and and when I talk, but or I can just hold <laughs> yeah. the mic, I guess. But. Oh, okay, get there. You go get closer to the mic. I know. I unfortunately my stand is so short and my table is so low, but I guess I can do this. Is that better if I bring it up here like this and talk? I'm not. I, I'm gonna let the docs do most of the talking tonight. So if I gotta bring it up here, that is fine as well. Can you guys hear me better like this? Let me know. Let me know. Oh, Liz says it's good on YouTube. Maybe it's a Facebook thing. I don't know. Yeah, I no, it's know. better when it's close to you. You you look like a, an influencer. <laughs> <laughs> That's what I'm trying to avoid. And uh, yeah, no, my, my mixer is the problem. And so I'm not hooked up to the mixer anymore. I'm just going straight to uh, straight to the mm. computer. So uh, I can do this. I can hold this mic when I speak if that's going to help. But uh, better, but I could hear. Fi oh, OK. She could hear fine before. Maybe if you guys turn up your volume, maybe that'll that'll work, too. But anyway, um, so let's get started, Doc, because I, I'm not sure where Dr. Brown is. Uh, and what? let's just give us, give us an overview of what you're seeing. We haven't had much discussion on the news. We haven't had much discussion uh, from anyone, really, uh, other than, you know, the, the, the little small nugget that they put out on... on uh, on Wednesdays, but just give us the the thirty thousand view yeah. uh, story about what's what's happening. So, I mean, the, the line is that the pandemic's on. Um, <laughs> so, uh, the numbers just keep staying high, and uh, variants keep being generated uh, from these massive numbers of infections and, and uh the the pandemic grinds on but uh, so i was wandering around with uh visitors in waikiki this uh holiday and and, uh, and I almost no sign that there's a pandemic going people are are uh, behaving in terms of any kind of precautions and protections and masks and so so forth so, um, and I was talking to uh, some 20 some and they say basically their peer group doesn't care about COVID anymore. And they think that uh, the, um, it's not, the severity is really not very bad. And, and so it's pretty much in the rear view mirror, except in terms of their, what, how thinking about it. But the, the virus is very, and, you know, I can show some. Um, data later and there's this new champion variant called XBB1.5 that is was detected in the wastewater in Honolulu but it's not been seen yet in any uh, cases that people have uh, where people have been tested but this is the this new uh, super contagious variant that's also immune evasive means your prior vaccinations and infections will not uh, protect you from getting infected. Hopefully they'll protect you from getting severely ill, but in terms of getting infected, uh, a genetic engineering laboratory for the virus to generate a yet another mutation and 
being a threat to, to pass it on to other people. Uh, it's very, it's so immune evasive. Um, prior, your pri whatever prior COVID you may have and vaccination is not going to stop the those uh, processes from winning. So, uh, you know, it's, uh, it's head and shoulders above this, the all, the variant soup that we've seen that's and it's going to be it i mean if if it behaves the numbers indicate we're going to see a big surge how big uh it's difficult to tell um so, so for example when when uh, ba5 was growing in hawaii it never caused much of a bump uh, uh it sort of just merged into the ba2 um surge of Omicron that was in the spring and never distinguished itself. But XBB15 is so extraordinarily contagious that it's probably going to produce a much bigger wave. As big as Omicron BA1, probably not, but we ha it remains to be seen. It was doubling every eight days in the United States. Case numbers doubling. So that's, that's monstrous. That's a monstrous rate of increase. And um, so, so that's it's. This is the this is the bowling ball, and we're the pins, and it's coming down the, the aisle. And we don't know uh, what it's going to do in detail, but uh, so you know, the president said the pandemic is over, but you know, we still have a problem with COVID. What does that mean? Um, the, the pandemic is. is the pandemic is over because he doesn't want to pay for it. That's all. Uh, you know, they, yeah. they, they know that it, mm. once the, the government acknowledges that the pandemic is not over, uh, then, they're, you know, they're going to be obligated to start dishing out more relief money. And, and I think that's they're, they're trying to convince themselves and the people that it's over. But what's the prevalence of this new variant here in Hawaii? Do we even know? Uh, it's only been de detected in the recent uh, wastewater report. Um, so it's not been detected at any PCR test that people have come and given. Um, so it's just getting started here, but it grows so rapidly, it won't take it long be before it comes dominant. It's, uh, as of last week, it was something like 40% of all cases, um, on the mainland were this XBB15 and it was doubling every eight days. So it's bound to be larger than that right now. And as far as illness uh we haven't seen any evidence that it's going to be uh more severe than omicron or yeah, per I, case I, yeah i mean yeah so <clears throat> it's too early to see um where the epicenters where it started was new york and hospitalizations have increased a great deal in new york so it's going to increase hospitalizations whether the chance per infection that it's uh, higher uh, more severe is not known yet but just on the basic biology. So the reason that this thing, one of the characteristics that's so very different about it is the how, how tightly it binds to our own ACE2 protein that's on the cells, our cells that the virus infects. So this new spike, <clears throat> this XBB15 spike really grabs onto it very strongly, which means you don't need as many viruses to get a cell uh, infected and producing more viruses. Uh, and that is believed to account for its really high uh, infectivity. So that could presumably produce more severe disease, but it remains to be seen. You know, I have a, a, a very, a very dear friend that just went to California. He's, you know, an elderly couple actually. And they went to California, went to, uh, on a family vacation and it was a large family vacation and they went down to Chinatown and, and ended up getting COVID mm. and uh, pretty bad mm. and they're vaccinated, they're boosted. His doctor or the doctor that saw him told him that he felt the doctor believed that this was the uh, may have been the original Delta. Is that possible? Is Delta still around? I haven't heard that Delta is, is being found anywhere. So that's an unusual thing to say. And, and he could have misunderstood. He could have meant, I was thinking he, the doctor meant Omicron um, and not any of these new variants. But it was lodged, it was deep in his chest, and he 
definitely lost his taste and smell and hmm. the body aches and fatigue. Uh, uh, he, he said it was, it was incredibly miserable. Hmm. Um, I just spoke to him a, a few days ago and he's recovering, but still has a nasty cough and, and still hmm. super tired. And his wife is still, uh, still sick and it's unfortunate, but, um, and, they they think they picked it up in in Chinatown, but they, obviously mm -hmm. it could be from anywhere. I still think it's probably from the, the airport or the airplane. They they mask up, they do all the precautions. Mm -hmm. But talking about China, uh, you know, we heard that China was really 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 bad. And I was talking to yesterday uh, a, a friend of a couple. The wife is from China, and she said that they are going to lift all restrictions next week. Uh, is that what you heard? I haven't. Unfortunately, I haven't. Uh, checked out China lately, but is that does that sound right? I I heard. I think I read that somewhere. I I've never tried to verify it. Um, I mean, obviously they uh, they've let um, COVID really rip through the whole population, um, but it's hard. It's you know it's hard to get information about what's really going on inside China. Um, I mean, it's it's dreadful what's happening there. Um, and uh, I mean that they were the the one holdout in terms of really stopping stopping COVID. And uh, you know the even though the um, uh, the lockdowns were severe, apparently um, most of the time, most of the places people just lived uh, as as they were in 2019. Um, but when there's an outbreak, the you know the response is very severe. Um, but th so that's what they're they've let go of, and, and the virus is is doing its thing. Well, I'm, I'm, sorry, I'm seeing I from the comments. Yeah. I'm seeing from the comments that uh, it, apparently they have lifted the restrictions as of today. So hmm. it was interesting when when they when it's probably two weeks ago, I guess it was now. Um, the news came out and said that 50 percent of the passengers that were leaving China was infected with COVID. Uh, which is incredibly frightening for the United States uh, because you know where where did they where where are they going right a lot of them are coming here and it really doesn't matter if it's the east coast west coast because eventually as we have seen time and time again uh, these uh, these variants make its way to Hawaii and it's a scary thing well, you know, I don't. I haven't heard that the variants that are in China <clears throat> that are dominant there are especially worrisome uh, for the rest of the world. So one of the things about the China population is they didn't, since they didn't have a lot of infection at all, um, <clears throat> the immunity they have is from their vaccines, and that gives a creates a whole different uh, fitness landscape, if you will, to the to the variants. So the one, so the ones that are dominant here, um, don't have the advantage of being immune evasive there because there's there isn't that immunity. So you'll have a different selection, and um, but with a, you know, over a, with a potential of billion people to get infected, that still a lot of evolution could go on. So I mean, there is a talk about people worrying about variants being generated in China, but they're going to be adapted to the China population, which has different different immunity history. And so those highly adapted variants may not do well outside in the rest of the world where there's all this pre-existing immunity that it hasn't encountered. So that's just a speculation. So the variants react differently to different demographics. Is that what you're saying? Well, yeah, basically. So I mean, the way our adaptive immunity works is you get this foreign protein and your body says, what is that? And then all these different um, immune cells uh, are generating antibodies and some of them will stick to this foreign protein, the spike protein, and that will that can cause a reaction to increase the production of those antibody proteins. So then your 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 body produces these massive amounts of these antibody proteins that glom on to the spike protein and prevent it from doing its job for the virus. So the virus is unable to get into the cells when it's surround, when it's basically uh, 
swamped by all these antibodies sticking to it. So that's why there's this natural selection for the virus to change its protein shape because it's basically like putting on a disguise. It's like some, you know, somebody uh, came and uh, you know a cashier say cheated you out of some money. And then you come back to the store again, it's the same cashier, but now they're wearing a disguise. And so you don't recognize them and you, you know, you have the same transaction. So that's what, how the virus is evolving. But when it changes the shape of its proteins, they may not function for the virus to get the virus into the cell. So it's a tricky search process for the virus to find a, a disguise that allows it to still carry out its, per, uh, its functions. And so that's why, that's why there's the natural selection for the immune evasiveness, which is basically the, the virus gets a disguise, but it can still do its job. And so every different population gets antibodies to the viruses that they've been exposed to or the vaccines they've been exposed to, but not to anything else. All right. And so, um, uh, it's, it's, it's going to, so the, the different variants are going to face different different pools of antibodies in each population that they've been in based on what the population already experienced as far as immunity whether it's vaccines yeah. or prior infection yeah got it uh, let me get to some of these questions right here doc uh and and xbb.1.5 is a hybrid of omicron yeah so omicron has been diversifying so there, we started with BA1, and then this few more mutations came out and made BA2, which then had caused another surge. But then, then we had you know, BA5, but then there's all these different variants, this I'll call it a swarm, that uh, where no one of them was able to take over. And different, part, different parts of the country, different, par different parts of the world would have different sub-variants of Omicron. And so this XBB, X stands for a crossover. And so somebody, and the first time the XBB was spotted was in India. And so probably somebody in India got infected with two variants at the same time, two subvariants, two uh, subvariants of XB, uh, excuse me, of BA2. So the, 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 these BA2s, there's one strain of BA2, subvariants that had one set of mutations, another BA2 offspring that had another set of mutations, and this person got infected by both of them at the same time, and in their cells, the genomes got mixed together. And that's what produced this recombinant XBB. So that XBB started growing and spreading around the world and um, forming an XBB1 variant and then in New York, somebody who wasn't being careful, let's put it that way, because if, you, if you're careful enough, you can avoid getting infected. Somebody got infected with XBB1 and their body became a gain of function laboratory for coronavirus and started cranking out massive you know, billions of these virus particles and some of them having mutations and it got one mutation in the spike protein that made it very strongly binding to the ACE2 protein that's in our, on our, our own cells. And then that started to take off. So it clearly had an epicenter in New York and started to spread from there. So that's where probably the, the very first XBB15 was created by, by an infection in somebody who who uh, you know was listening to the the crowd and not worrying about COVID, and now that's spreading to the spreading to the whole country. Which unfortunately is kind of the norm now. Uh, you know, we just got back from Oregon, and uh, it's amazing. It's like the the pandemic is over uh, in in most places. You know, of course, we mask up. We we do all we, what we need to in the airplane, but there's so many people not not wearing uh, masks on the airplanes. And we have a flight attendant here in the in the chat, who uh, mm -hmm. I, I'm not gonna share names, but I think you could probably figure out because she has a lot of information on flights. 
uh, going to Milan from China. But where, where, <laughs> where are we headed? Uh, I remember you all, you and Dr. Brown and many of the other people we've had on the show uh, told us long ago that this was going to be around for a while, that it was not going to go away. And, and we are lucky that, I, I don't know if we're lucky, but the, the, the illness is not as severe as we saw back in Delta. But people are still dying at a high rate. And that should be a warning enough, I think, for people to to take precautions. Um, well, I mean, what? Where are we headed with this? Yeah, thing? where are we headed? <clears throat> well, you know, I remember I don't know it was like a year or so ago. Um, <clears throat> Dr. Brown, in giving a talk, said, uh, you know, the, the amount of time it takes for a <clears throat> new pandemic virus to settle down, he says, you know, it could take five years. I thought, oh my God, five years, really? So we're here we are starting year four of the pandemic. So I guess I would say, so I've got a bunch of slides with the data on it, um, which we can go to. But, yeah, go um, ahead. I don't, I'm not sure what happened to Dr. Brown. Uh, maybe he got, maybe he got interviewed out today uh, on Spotlight. Huh. <coughs> okay, so, yeah, all right, I'll, I'll, let's, let's go to that. Let's, uh, fill in let's, the... let's, uh, let's hit this question real quick. I may have missed yeah. it, but what are your recommendations for protecting ourselves from this? CDC really ticked me off. I think the CDC yeah. pissed everybody off. Uh, I think they did. I think a lot of the... Pro anyway, what, <laughs> what are your recommendations? <laughs> okay. This is, this is your guardian. This little simple thing when adopted on a mass basis could basically bring us into to infinitesimally smaller numbers of cases, all right? So this is my favorite brand, the, the 3M Aura 9210 Plus. It's got wonderful, nice, uh, durable elastic bands here. And uh, it's like 98% of all particles are blocked. Uh, at, at, at worst, only 2% can get through. So. Um, and people can do this on an individual basis, but to get people to do it on a mass basis, they have to see the reason for it. They have to understand that, um, you know, other masks just don't cut it. Uh, with these extremely evolved contagious variants, they, um, they, they just penetrate other masks very easily. So the, the most common mask, which is the tradition in medicine is that pleated blue uh, surgical mask and those things have like a 60% leakage rate okay that is not going to protect you when the air itself is is full of uh, the coronavirus uh, th through these aerosol particles that are just floating around the air like smoke from somebody who's just breathing sitting in a room that's unventilated so so an N95 mask so the, the one, I mean, the one thing, there's never been public mess, public messaging to, to get the right mask. All right. That's, a, you know, if you, if you had a, a scuba school and they never told you about what kind of mask to bring, and then some people brought, you know, snorkel masks or, uh, you know, I don't know what, uh, swim goggles, uh, you're not going to have a good, a good graduating class of your of your scuba lesson from that and so you really have to have the right equipment um, now kf94s and kn95s um, have different issues so the kf94 the material is very good uh, but the fit ha um, is not very good so the fits better the better than um, the surgical masks, the pleated masks but the, uh, the, they have still quite a bit of leakage, like 25% uh, leakage. So if, I mean, if you can get a KF94 to fit you really well, um, then it should provide good safety. And now the KN95s have better fit overall than the KF94s. So that's the, the Chinese um, uh, uh, certificate, um, KN95. The problem is the, mar the market is flooded with fake counterfeit KN95s that some of them are just junk. And so you have to find, you have to buy it through a reputable, reputable dealer to get 
make sure you're getting an authentic KN95. But those um, can fit pretty well. So the fit is really crucial. One, you know, you can have great fabric, but if there's leaks on the side of the cheeks or leaks around the nose, you're getting the, the uh, pu you know, the dirty air is just co going right in and uh, you're going to breathe it in. So that's, I mean, th you know, these will protect you if you get them to fit and, and you wear them religiously uh, when you're in any, any indoor area. So um, that's, that's one thing you can do personally. Now, the problem is um, people are connected. They're in families and households and everybody in the family has to get on the same, get on the same page because it just takes one to bring it into the house. And then it's, then it's much harder to keep from um, spreading. So, um, so, so the, your recommendation yeah. is like the 3M N95, and, and, and that can be purchased. I looked it up on Amazon. It's not expensive at all. Uh, I mean, it's, it's not expensive at all. Yeah, you no, know, it's like a dollar. You can get them for about a dollar a piece or, or even cheaper. Yeah. Um, and, uh, you know, so the, the same model won't fit everybody. So the most important thing is, it, you know, if, you're, if it doesn't feel like it's fitting well, uh, try a different model and there's lots of recommendations on the web uh, for other models to get if you have a small face there's another brand called another model called the v-flex 3m v-flex and these come in a small size so some people with smaller faces are finding the v-flex to be advantageous to be a better fit um, but the three yeah the 3ms are um, they're american made though the some of the fabric is sourced from china uh, we are so dependent on China for manufacturing, but uh, they're produced here. And uh, so that's, that, this will prevent infection. Now, the bivalent booster is the best vaccine you can get, um, but it's, it's not proving very good to, to prevent infection uh, from the new Omicron variants. Um, so it has half of the vaccine is the BA5 spike. And so it provides um, some better protection against BA5, but BA5 now is in decline and XBB15 is, uh, is now infecting people that have that. So your best, your best backstop, let's put it that way, the, the vaccine is your best backstop if you get infected from having severe disease. Now, so um, if you get infected, actually there's a number of interesting uh, research results. Um, one of them was that uh, the, the, the diabetes drug metformin seems to reduce uh, severe di disease by like 40%. Another was that uh, a nasal rinse uh, just twice a, a day, you can buy them in the drugstore, uh, also had something like an 80% reduction in hospitalizations. Um, so, you know, these are these are results from the primary research literature. These are not something that is in the, the, the formulary or the standard protocol, but, uh, but these are things that are likely to be uh, uh, safe if you can obtain them. Um, and uh, so another problem is that XBB15, there's no monoclonal antibodies now that work on it. So the choice you have for treatments is Paxlovid, which seems to still work very well. And uh, the problem with Paxlovid is that it interacts with a lot of other drugs and older people that uh, may get infected, um, may be taking drugs, a lot of blood thinners, um, anticoagulants interact with um, Paxlovid and so they, they, they can't take that. So then there's another one, another drug, which I would avoid if possible called Molnupiravir which causes the virus to mutate, uh, to mutate so much that it, um, it reduces its growth in the body. And so um, that's, that pretty much is available to anybody. Um, there's not much that contraindicates taking it. So um, those are the two. Then the other is remdesivir, which is an injected drug. And those are the only three uh, pharmacological agents that uh, are antiviral that I know of that currently available. So, um, 
And that's that's the current wall of protection that I that comes to mind. Yeah, scary stuff. The friend uh, that I was talking about earlier um, could not take any of it. Um, mm. It was Tylenol, and just just a miserable time because of his, uh, you know, his other medical issues. Mm. Then didn't, didn't, he couldn't get the Paxlovid and whatever else they had. So, yeah, I felt really sorry for him. But thank God he's he's better now and, and he's recovering. Um, I can only imagine I, if he wasn't vaccinated or not boosted, you know, because uh, he's an elderly guy. He's mm. he's up in his upper 80s. So, well, I read but, something that 90 percent of the deaths now from COVID are like 65 and over. Yeah. Yeah. Sad. So let's uh, I hope your friend pulls through yeah. and heals up well. Yeah, thanks. So let's get to the charts, Doc. Let's get to the charts. OK, now. OK. Let's now, let's see. How do I do this? What's the where's the button to share? You should have a share screen button on the bottom. It's been that long, Doc. It's been it's, it's been that long. There's there, there ain't no word share on here. There's a little uh, a little oh, there. Screen. Okay, there it is. I yeah, see. It. Yeah, okay. Yeah, okay. The right. screen with the arrow. It's been a while, Mel. <laughs> <laughs> I know. Too long, actually. Too long. Well, I mean, fortunately, uh, well, actually, as we'll see in the numbers. Um, as we see in the numbers, uh, we've been in a sort of a static spell. Uh, so these are my, this is my skinny on uh, what was going on. We've actually covered most of it. Um, the Congress has voted no budget for the pandemic response. And, and you know, we're really actually in a historic moment, in my mind, of, of a society-wide, what you want to call it, delusion uh, a, a, a mass uh, mass delusion that the pandemic is over, um, facilitated by you know statements like the pandemic is over from the president, but people actually just thinking in their mind that really they don't have to worry about COVID anymore. This, you know, the data. This is you can't see COVID in the air if if no if nobody know you know is sick of it from it um, you don't see it in your personal network and you may be tempted just from your own personal data to think that the, the pandemic is over but when you look at the global data and the, even the hawaii data it's clearly not and um so let's go look at it um, so this is the daily cases in hawaii the recorded pcr tests that are positive for the whole pandemic so this this peak here can you see the cursor does it move? Should I move your cursor? Do you see the little hand? No, I nope. can't see the cursor, no. No, okay. Um, so the big peak on the left, that was Delta. The massive peak in the middle is Omicron BA1. The peak to the right of it is the BA2 peak. And then you kind of see this little bump here, that's BA5. And so now for four months, the case counts have been just flat, All right? And this is, there's no other period of the pandemic except before Delta, where it was kind of bouncing up and down, where we've seen such a flat period. So, you but know, Doc, and, this is this yeah. is based on PCR tests, right? Yes, right. Okay. Right. So, um, but let's look at the positivity rates. So what we see here in this look in this uh, recent last four months is that um it's a, this is a higher level on the positivity side than in the case side and we see the cases are down there was like a 150 something like that but when you look at the positivity rate which is the fraction of pcr tests that turn out positive it's it's much higher relatively and we can actually um, we can actually compare that to the other days of the pandemic. So if if you look at this past week's positivity rates and compare it to all the days of the pandemic, this uh, weekly average of seven point seven percent positive tests is higher than eighty percent of the days of the pandemic. Okay, so this is extremely far from the pandemic being over, okay, in terms of tests 
and it's actually 2.62 times the median value uh, for the whole pandemic. So that's the median is 2.9%, which means half the days of the pandemic, it's been above 2.9 and half the days it's been below 2.9. And so this, this weekly average is 2.6 times that high. Now in cases, uh, because well, fewer and fewer. Well, let's look at the tests. <laughs> this this explains the difference between cases and positivity. The number of tests last week, there were only 14% of all the days of the pandemic that had fewer tests than this past week. So the, the median for the whole pandemic was 3,700 tests a day. In this past week, it's a 1,460 tests a day. And so this... Uh, so basically, all but 14% of the days of the pandemic have had uh, more tests than we had this past week. So that's really changing our measurement ability to measure how much COVID there is in Hawaii. Um, so that's why the positivity is in the 80th percentile, whereas cases are still above the median by 25% in the 59th percentile and hospitalized. So the median number of people in the hospital with COVID uh, for the whole pandemic was 65. Uh, this past week, it's at 80.4, which is 24% above the median. So, and, and there's been more in the hospital this past week than on 63% of the days of the whole pandemic. So we are in a high, in the upper third quartile of these statistics and uh and actually this is the the positivity is in the upper fourth quartile so these are all high numbers all right as far as the whole pandemic is gone so we don't see a, a, a unfortunately a, a anything dropping to the bottom except how much people are getting tested so um right which which yeah. which directly correlates to the lower numbers of cases um, not hospitalized yeah. because that one, you know, that one, whether you took a test or yeah. not, uh, that, that one's outside of the control, but, um, but the, but the case counts. And, and I think that's what the government relies on. And that's how they pat themselves on the back every week to, to see how wonderful we're doing because of the case counts. But the positivity rate has always been Kauai, especially has always been much mm. higher because I think we have more opportunities to test. Um, our mm. testing facilities are still open. And uh, and I think that that is why mm -hmm. Kauai has a higher positivity rate than the other counties. So there's actually a great. <clears throat> so that how can so the problem is that well the positivity rate depends on what causes you to go and get a test, and um, so that can vary. Uh, you know, that that can be that's a human behavior thing. So two things that are not human behavior dependent are. The wastewater and that's why it's so important the second is uh the number of asymptomatic people that that check into the hospital that test positive for COVID. okay so that that number is um you know that's the uh, people in the hospital not, not because of COVID, but just with COVID. and that's a good measure of how much COVID there is in the community but unfortunately um, that num those numbers for Hawaii hospitals have not been made public, but it would be great, uh, very important to, as a ground truth to know how much COVID there is in the community. Long COVID is, is getting a lot of attention again. I, I shouldn't say a lot, but more attention than, than it did in the past because now, uh, you know, it, it's, it's, it's becoming quite common, um, Actually, Dr. Miskovich was on the news tonight and he was talking about how the long COVID, the brain fog is actually uh, brain damage. And they're seeing a lot of issues with long COVID and, and causing these people, uh, you know, conditions where are preventing them. And, and you, again, everyone, all of you guys predicted this way back. Watch for the long COVID because it's going to impact the economy. It's going to impact workforces. It's going to do all of that. And exactly what was predicted in the past, we're seeing happen right now. In fact, uh, just this week, a, a report came out from New Hero, the uh, University of Hawaii Economics. I forget what the other letters stand for, but um, that estimates uh, thousands of uh, workers in Hawaii are 
are out of work or not able to work because of long COVID. And um, I could, I'd like to find that number. So and keep out for, keep an eye out for that report. Um, and it was actually, it was written about in Civil Beat, I believe. So there should be an article there uh, on it. And um, so, I mean, by far the worst, the, the most likely really bad thing to happen to you from COVID is long COVID. And it's always been that way. So the, the, the hospitalization rate of COVID has uh, you know, never been above uh, 10% to my, as far as I recall, and the death rate has uh, not been above 1%, but long COVID rates are estimated to be like 20% of everybody who gets infected has some lingering long lasting um, health problem from having had COVID. And, um, and that's just what, what people notice. So it's really important to understand that COVID is completely different from a cold um, in that it lands, it, you know, it starts in the nose and the lungs and the respiratory tract, and that's where the infection starts, but then it gets into the bloodstream. And the lining of all of our blood vessels has the kind of cells that the virus can inject itself into and start replicating it. So it has the potential to really um, injure the, the lining of all, of all of our blood vessels down to the capillaries. So that's the epithelial layer. So how much it does that, that's so dependent on each person. And um, um, so the, um, the extent of the, of the disease uh, is so variable. So it's really like a roulette, Russian roulette. All right, so a lot of people, uh, when they play Russian roulette, they just get a click and they think it's a harmless game. But then some people get the bullet and that's the way that COVID operates. I don't know of any other virus. Well, I mean, polio is kind of like that where something like uh, Dr. Brown probably has the, the specific number, but there's something like 1% death rate um, but a, and a small fraction get paralyzed and almost everybody has the, on average as asymptomatic. So that's another kind of Russian roulette virus. And so that's really important to think about. If you're trying to assess how bad is this, it's almost always, um, um, it's mild in most infections, but it can be very, it can be very serious in a large fraction. So um, let me, let me say hi to Dr. Brown. <laughs> yeah. Sorry to be late, guys. That's yeah, all right, man. I, I was thinking, what the hell, man? Did I say something bad? Did I say something wrong? <laughs> he said, not, you're not coming on. How are you, Doc? Oh, surviving. Surviving. I, I didn't get a chance to watch your spotlight yet. I will. Uh, but how, how did that go today? Oh, fairly well, I think. Just kind of explaining where we, where we are right now and the fact that, yeah, we probably saw about a 20% bump or so in transmission over the holidays. Uh in the absence of any changes, I think it'll come back down to where we've been, because uh, largely we've been at, a, I think, pretty much an endemic level of around 160 infections a day or so on a statewide basis. And we're likely to go back to that if the variant mix stays the way it is now. But the real question is, what's going to be happening with XBB15, which I'm sure you guys have been discussing in the last few minutes. Yeah, Dr. Altenberg uh, briefed us on the whatever, 1B, one, one whatever, BB15, <laughs> whatever. Um, the Kraken, the Kraken, the Kraken variant. Uh, and and uh, we, we spoke a lot of that. And uh, just, I guess, trying to figure out where do we go from here? What should we expect? Um, is this variant expected? You know, do we know how uh, the illness, is it, is it more severe? Is it, is it standing up towards the vaccines? And there's a lot of questions because there really is nowhere to go to get the answers. Uh, no one's, no one's telling us, but. No, I think, you know, the, the one thing that sort of gives some indications there are the hospitalization rates in those states like Massachusetts and Connecticut and New York, where the, uh, XBB one five is now dominant. Uh, they are seeing a somewhat higher hospitalization rate than we're seeing in the rest of the country. So I think, you know, that gives me some indication that it's likely to lead to more hospitalizations. But again, that seems to be concentrated primarily among the elderly. 
uh, you're really seeing it shoot up in the 70 plus and also a pretty significant rise in the 60s, 69s. So again, I think, you know, the real risk there is going to be for older folks or for immunocompromised folks who, you know, especially those who haven't vaccinated recently. You know, it's important to remember the uptake of the bivalent booster at this point is only 15% nationwide and only about 24% in Hawaii. So we're still way short of where we need to be in terms of getting people boosted. And that's really rather foolish at this point because that could probably avert a lot of those hospitalizations and a lot of the deaths that will also result. It's, I think it's safe to say now uh, that I think for the majority of people, they've, they're done with vaccinations and boosters. I, I think in Hawaii anyway, I can, I'm, just from what I'm hearing, the people I talk to every day, uh, you know, they may have gotten that first booster, but, but they're, not, they're not getting there. I think a lot of people really believe that the, the pandemic is over and, and, it, and it's not. And, and the reason they think that is because, like Dr. Altenberg said earlier, when a president of the United States of America tells the world that the pandemic is over, uh, you want to believe that, right? I think a lot of us want to believe that. And when it's coming from the president, uh, it gives you that justification to, to say, yeah, I knew it. It's over. So toss well, out I think, the, you know, the, the precautions. The, the problem with that is that if you look at the numbers, it's not over. It's far from over. Uh, you know, we're still seeing over 300 deaths a day basically related to COVID. Uh, on an annual basis, that's still five times the rate of a bad flu season. Uh, flu already has killed 13,000 people in this country. And so masking would be really intelligent at this point, not just for COVID, but also for flu. But we're not seeing that. Uh, and, and the reality is, if, if we believe, as I actually do now, that pretty much we had reached an endemic state over the last three or four months, especially prior to Thanksgiving, where we were pretty much at the same level of cases every day and when the testing was pretty constant, I think that represents our endemic state, which is something on the order of 160 infections per day detected within the state on a comparatively low testing basis. Probably a lot more that are occurring that just aren't picked up because they're either home testing or they're not testing at all. Uh, and that's kind of, I think, the endemic state that we can expect with the current set of variants. And that's still a high level of infection in the community. And because we know how risky breakthrough infections are for those who are older or those who are immunocompromised, those people are still going to have to continue to take precautions if they don't want to end up in the hospital or end up being one of those who unfortunately pass away. And so, you know, I'm kind of settling myself in at my age, basically, you know, I'm kind of expecting I'll be masking for the foreseeable future, at least in crowds. Uh, you know, I will attempt to minimize contacts in closed rooms and things of this sort. I certainly will not be eating in restaurants without a mask on. Uh, just because with that sort of level of endemic illness, the possibility of getting infected is still quite high. So I do think, you know, that's something that people really need to keep in mind as we're going forward, especially if you're older or you're immunocompromised. And that's that, I think, is the real concern right now. Yeah, I mean, it, it's no coincidence that when we uh, early on in the pandemic and I'm talking about after all the the lockdowns and, and all the restrictions. But when the masks masking, everyone was still willingly uh, wearing a mask because they, they they were still concerned. The fact that we didn't have much flu cases, the fact that we didn't have many people getting sick, it's because the, those doggone masks work. And, you know, people have short memories. They, they, they actually have really, really short memories. I when I, I think, you know, it's, it's actually, you know, I saw one quite interesting analysis. It was kind of a back of the envelope calculation by, done by a, a scientist named James Ward, who looks at these things. And he was, you know, what he was pointing out, I mean, what we expect in the long run with these types of epidemics, where immunity does build up in the population over time, is we expect to see sort of decreasing waves of infection. So, you know, it goes up, comes down goes up a little less the next time, a little less the next time, and so on. And then it settles in at that endemic state. I think that endemic state, like we've said right now, because this particular virus is so contagious, is actually fairly high. It's a, a fairly high level of COVID circulation probably year-round, and it will go up again when we get holidays or people gathering more indoors and so on. 
Uh, but what was interesting, is kind of an additional analysis he did, that if we had a reasonable level of use of NPIs, you know, non-pharmaceutical inventions, masking, basically, and, you know, cleaning the air, you know, using HEPA filters, using good ventilation systems, and so on, we could probably drive that R down below one, that reproductive rate. If we drive it below one, then the epidemic will gradually die out. But it's not going to do it by itself. It's not going to do it unless we take an additional measure to try to reduce transmission in the population. Otherwise, we're pretty much going to end up where we are right now with this relatively, I, I still consider it a fairly high number of cases on an ongoing basis. Uh, you know, two years ago, if we looked at this, we would have considered it an outrageous number. Now we just look and say, oh, one sixty. Yeah. Yeah, you know, I mean, so, it's, just, it's like we're saying, yay! <laughs> and, and, you know, and it's true because a population immunity is built up so much, a lot of people are not suffering severe illness or death. And that's good. You know, young people actually probably don't have that much to worry. Some of them will still get severely ill, and some of them will die. But the number there is relatively low. But when you get to the older population, this one is, de you know, it's, it's similar to the flu, except about five times as bad as the flu. The flu is the same thing. It affects children. It affects older folks. You know, the COVID affects children. And, you know, the Omicron variant sent a lot of kids to the pediatric hospitals. Because especially for young children, the Omicron variant, because it's, it's so much involved in the upper airways, their airways are relatively narrow to begin with. A lot of them end up getting hospitalized because they had a lot of hospitalizations with Omicron among children. And then we get a lot of hospitalizations among older folks. So I think, you know, that's what we're headed. But, you know, if you actually look at the analyses of background mortality and so on in different countries, basically it's going to settle in at about a level that's probably about five times as high as what flu is generally producing. Now, is that an acceptable level of deaths? Are we willing to accept 150,000 deaths a year in the United States due to COVID? Just treat that as business as usual? I mean, that's a policy decision. Yeah. And I, and Unfortunately, I like you're saying, most people were deciding, okay, we can live with that. Because yeah, yeah, I mean that's what it boils down to. And I think uh, you know our decision makers have basically said, yeah, that that it's it's an acceptable <laughs> number. Um, I mean, Dr. I'd much rather see us adopt policies similar to what Japan does, which is you know, just set a norm that during the winter, hmm. most people actually consider masking in public, and if you're sick, you never ever even think about going out without a mask on. Yeah. And preferably you don't go out at all you know a norm like that would go a long way because i'm sick to death of hearing people hacking away <clears throat> at stores in elevators and other places it infuriates me because those people are knowingly out there spreading viruses they don't know whether they've got COVID or rsv or flu any one of those can kill people and so you know that, yeah. that little lack of social responsibility just really angers me and, and I'm seeing that more and more and more uh, all over the place. And it's, it's horrific. It's horrific. Uh, Dr. Altenberg, you uh, had a chart up. And I know you had some wastewater oh, yeah. numbers up there. But let me, let me go ahead and put that chart up again. Yeah. Well, so this is when talking about reproduction number. So this is uh, from Trevor Bedford. Um, and so the, this, these are the reproduction numbers. How many... In people uh, and a single infected person infects, all right? So here's one, the, the one line. If it's below that, which Dr. Brown spoke of, then th these cases drop and die off. If it's above one, then they grow exponentially. So this is the swarm we've had since BA5. And there, you know, there's BA5 on the left, um, sort of a media, very, looking very mediocre. But uh, so this is this swarm of almost equivalent uh, fitness subvariants, but way the heck up here is XBB15. It's nowhere near any of the others, and this is why um, people are concerned and why it looks like for sure we're going to get a big wave out of it. How big? Who knows? But it's so strikingly different from the rest in its reproduction number. The that that is higher than any variant we've seen. That R number. Yeah, um, that R. Yeah, R. Well, I mean, 
it's higher than all the other variants that we have to compare it with now at this moment in time. Uh, I mean, the BA1, that, was, that had an extremely high reproduction number, and that's why it spread so fast. But uh, compared to all the variants that are in our population now, it's uh, head and shoulders above the rest in reproduction. But, but isn't yeah, that expected of variants? Isn't that expected of, of these, these variants that they, they tend to become more contagious and maybe not? We, we don't know what the, the variants will do whether, with the severity of the illness, but isn't it normal for a variant when, when they do break off and, and whatever mutate that it, it, they do it because they, they, they want to get more contagious? Isn't that what they do? Well, so contagiousness comes from two things. One is just how how small a number of viruses it takes to start an infection in a person um, versus the immunity that's there waiting for the virus, okay? And so that, that immunity depends on each population and their history of exposure uh, and vaccination. And so that's a big variable between different populations. And so once... You know, once the virus has been through the population and generated a bunch of antibodies to that variant, it's kind of a, it's kind of yesterday's paper. All right, it's it doesn't have the ability to infect anymore, and so that's why that's why when you had a peak, it goes down because it's run out of people without immunity. So, but some other little mutation somewhere evades that immunity, and then that. Um, that new subvariant then starts to infect more than one person from every infection, and that's what takes off. So the, that swarm of, um, if you can go back to the slide, that swarm of variants, uh, that, this was novel, okay? We didn't see that prior to Omicron, where it had this, was splitting off into all these different variants that were all, you know, um, more infection, that were all gaining in a certain period of time but in very distinct numbers. Prior to that, you had one variant that was so spectacular, it came through and created a big surge, all right? And so that was what, so Alpha did that. Well, that's, I mean, this is how they named the, the variants of concern, Alpha, Beta, Gamma, Delta did that in a huge way, and then BA1 Omicron did that. But in these past four months, we've had this kind of swarm where nothing, had that much of a great advantage over over everything else, and so nothing was able to drive everything else to um, to, uh, uh, to low numbers. But now, you know, it, is it normal? So XBB15 is not like the rest of this swarm; it's distinct. So it's more like, uh, in terms of standing out from the crowd, it's more like um, the previous variants of concern: um, Alpha, Delta, and uh, Omicron. Yeah, another interesting thing to say about XBB15, it's actually only a three site difference from XBB. But one of those sites basically involved two mutations, which is relatively rare and much more difficult to occur. And that's why we don't see more of these types of variants evolving. But that mutation gave it this much, much higher affinity for spike protein and basically uh, gave us this much, much higher uh, transmissibility of this new variant and so it was really like i say only a three site change but it was enough to make a huge difference in terms of how transmissible and you know that could happen again and what i want to say is this is basically you know i think there's a real difference between this pandemic and pandemics of the past in the sense that yeah we probably had a covid pandemic back in the late 1800s the 1889 flu epidemic but it was probably uh, what we now call OC43, which is one of the coronaviruses that causes the common cold. That probably transitioned in 1889 into the human population. And we saw exactly what we saw here, large spikes in mortality and so on. The difference was the world was not connected the way it is now. And the population of the world was much, much smaller. And so the probability of all these mutations occurring was much, much lower. Today, we've got a completely interconnected world. What's in the, New York right now has literally already spread around the world. You know, XBB15 has already been seen in China. It's been seen in Australia. It's been seen over 29 countries at this point. It's throughout Europe at this point, growing pretty rapidly in the UK. So that interconnection 
basically means this virus now has an entire population of 7 billion humans to feast on. And that gives it a huge advantage in terms of trying out all sorts of different evolutionary pathways until it finds one that sticks. And we have not, we have helped the virus with our let it rip mentality that we've taken the United States, you know, and people are very critical of China at this point. Oh, you know, China's making these mistakes. Well, I challenge you, tell me the differences between the current Chinese response and the response in the United States. They're really not that radically different. They're all basically, yeah, you don't have to worry about it. It's a mild infection, you know, let it rip. And that's what we've done here. We don't promote masking. You know, our vaccination rate is even lower than the Chinese vaccination rate, even though their vaccines are terrible. They were really bad vaccines. Their vaccination rate is 90%. Their boosting rate is something like 45%, I think, in the last year. So they're much better off than we are in that regard, except for the fact that they're using a poor vaccine. If they were using one of the Western vaccines, they'd actually be in better shape than we are probably right now, except for the fact they don't have any built up immunity from past infection because they've been locked down for so long. So that past, that protection from past infections is completely missing in China. And that's what makes China so vulnerable right now. Like I say, I challenge you, find a difference between the United States response and the COVID response right now. They're really not that radically different. Yeah, I think it's pretty similar. I think in, in most places, uh, it's just, I think as Dr. Altenberg talked about earlier, you know, the different communities, the different countries, the different uh, levels of uh, immune immunity from in prior infection, like you just mentioned, China has very little, uh, that all, uh, it plays a key role and and uh you know i think it's a perfect storm here in our, in, in our country <laughs> it's just the perfect storm and i worry about this new this new variant be because uh it, the the opportunities to spread is is so so great and, and i think that's what i worry about uh i'm not sure if you were on we talked about a friend of mine who who got covid while he was traveling and he's from here and he's, he's still sick and He's an elderly gentleman and his wife is, is, is sick and they both got COVID. And, but, but you, you, you don't, the, the, the emphasis is no longer on COVID here in our, at least in our state. And I think in many other states. And I just came back from Oregon. They, COVID, what's, COVID's done. COVID's gone. I mean, they don't even think it's, it's around. And that's a scary, scary thing. Well, I think, you know, you know, to me, Mel, one of the best analogies I've heard is, you know, with respiratory viruses, and it's not just COVID, it's flu, it's RSV, it's rhinoviruses, you know, there's 15 different respiratory viruses circulating in the U.S. right now, probably more than that, you know, 15 that are sort of being tracked. And with all those respiratory viruses out there, why are we not calling for clean air? You know, instead, we get a bunch of idiots who get out there on social media and say, oh, well, you know, getting infected with these things is good because it builds immunity and so on. <laughs> You know, that is exactly the same as recommending that people drink contaminated water to contract cholera because it will strengthen their immune system. You know, there is no difference. And yet we have standards for clean water. Why do we not set standards for clean air? Because we could address a lot of these respiratory illnesses if we required clean air in workplaces, clean air in stores. And we also made very strict rules about people coming in sick to work or to public places. People who are hacking should be shown the door. That's the bottom line. They should not be in a public space. And, you know, simple things like that could go a long way toward radically reducing the level of respiratory viruses in the United States. And yet we see no real motion, no real push to basically impose standards like that and to require businesses to provide a safe workplace. And to me, that's really troubling. Yeah, well, it's I, like I, I, I still think that the masks on flights is, is it's a uh, necessary inconvenience. Uh, I mean, I think that the airports, I mean, Lord have mercy. Uh, you know, we, we it's a mess. It is a total mess. And, you know, the the large amount of people that are close together from all over the world in one little area, especially during these. Uh, canceled flights uh, these periods mm. of when the airports I mean it was thousands of people uh, like cattle in, in a terminal with uh, 
eighty percent of them didn't have a mask on. That is incredible. It's well, there, you know, I, I think absolutely we should still have mask requirements in all public transportation, and that includes airports and on planes. And in addition to that, you know, we should have requirements. Yeah, the, the airline industry tells us all about how well, you know, all the air in the cabin is HEPA filtered and so on and so forth. Yeah, that may be true while it's in the air, but while it's on the ground, basically the air quality is absolutely abysmal. I mean, CO2 levels go up to 4,000, 5,000 from 600 back, you know, background level. It's just insane. And we do nothing to try to clean that air. So you're really exposing everybody on that plane. And then in, the, in this last travel season where people were literally sitting on the tarmac for three and four hours at a time, I, I have, even if you're wearing a mask, I really have a hard time seeing how most of those people got off without getting something. Yeah. I mean, just, yeah, the fact that not, not everybody has COVID right now, given that there's n nobody taking precautions, uh, is a testimony to how much uh, immunity the population does have. But, uh, but it's, not, you know, it's not enough to stop us from getting these very high levels of infection. The, and, you know, so, I, you know, the evolution of these variants, I think of it's kind of like baseball, all right? Um, I'm not a big, big baseball watcher but uh, you know most of what you see is like uh, uh, walks and and singles and doubles right and then every once in a while you get this home run uh, did I did I did I say it right yeah <laughs> so we saw a lot of you know a lot of singles and doubles and walks in the in the in the past four months of all this variant stew but now XBB15 that's the home run all right that everybody comes to the ballpark to watch for and uh, unfortunately um it's not uh fun and games um but that's how how it works um with the the variant evolution so i mean the the hope that we have um for just the 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 course of things without any human intervention is just that <clears throat> the built-up immunity in the populations will force the evolution of the virus to um, get compromised and compromise its transmissibility and its uh, and hopefully along with that uh, its uh, virulence and and become a more mild disease but it's nowhere near that now and I remember Dr. Brown some presentation you gave some uh, last year or so I think you said it was like f took f could take five years for that to happen do I remember correctly yeah and, and I think you know right now you know, to, to draw your baseball analogy a little further, the off-season training camp for this particular virus <laughs> consists of 7 billion people. <laughs> okay? So it's got lots of opportunities to hit that home run, especially as long as none of us are taking precautions, basically, to try to reduce the spread. So I do think that, yeah, the problem is we're going to continue to see home runs for a while. Eventually, yes, we will reach a level of population immunity that is such that It'll be very, very difficult for it to hit any more home runs. At that point, it will become similar to the current coronavirus common colds, you know, those four coronaviruses that give us common colds with sort of an annual cycle. That's where I honestly expect it to go. The reason we're not seeing annual cycles right now where it just goes up again in the cooler part of the year is because we're still getting this evolution occurring and we're getting these new variants with more immune escape and more transmissibility just popping up from time to time. When that happens, we get a wave. It's actually, it's quite interesting. If you actually look at the wave pattern, probably best now measured by hospitalizations in France, hmm. it's quite interesting. It goes up, comes down. It goes up a little slightly lower than it was the last time, comes hmm. down. It goes up, comes down a little lower, comes down a little lower, but then it's gone up a little bit more this time because of these, these new variants that have more immune escape. Okay, but in general, we saw that sort of decreasing wave over time, and that's what we would expect to see. But these new variants, these new home runs that pop in there, will put us, will bump up the wave again, and then we'll be back to cycling down from a higher level again. So that's probably going to go on for several years. Wow, I, I got I got a last question. I know we we're past our time, but I did want to ask this one question, and it'll be my last question what what are the chances that we'll see another not a variant but another strain you know we went whatever alpha bravo delta omicron and now we're at uh, what are the chances 
that we could see a, a, another completely new strain. I don't know what alphabet we're on right now, um, but is it possible that we could even see another new, not variant, but a new strain, a new letter, a new alphabet? Well, that would have to, I mean, so they're not changing the name for any of Omicron's descendants. They're not giving it a new name. And so to get to get a new name would have to be something that was sitting around uh, and they think in an immu immunocompromised person with a long-term infection, uh, one of the variants before Omicron that suddenly gets a bunch of mutations and then uh, becomes a new champion uh, spreader. So that's, uh, there's no way to rule that out. Um, so Omicron really seemed to come out of the, bl the blue and it wasn't descended from the previous variants of concern. Now the word strain, uh, uh, they just these are all just called variants of concern. When they have a, it's a variant. It's got mutations and it's got a high, uh, uh, a high replication rate. Um, so uh, Omicron didn't descend from any of the previous variants of concern. It was from a much earlier part in the viral evolution, sitting around somewhere, picking up a massive numbers of mutations before something caused it to go back into the whole population and take over what so there's no that's only happened uh well actually this is true for each of the previous variants of concern none of them evolved from each other they evolved from you know low-lying under the radar uh earlier uh variants and then they just exploded so what's the chance that that can happen again well it's it's happened uh you know at least uh, once uh well let's see i mean hasn't happened omicron hasn't happened that that scale of event hasn't happened since last uh, november a, a year ago so we might expect uh, at least a year before it could happen but that's just a crude statistical estimate um there's no reason to rule it out and i think you know the thing to note there is that would still be within the sars cov2 family and the good part there is that especially some of our T-cell immunity, will certainly provide some protection against severe illness and death. A lot of people probably for most of the SARS-CoV-2 family. Now, we could still get a much more virulent one that comes along. If we get something that, for example, can once again infect the lower lungs, uh, which the Omicron family does not, it primarily stays in the upper airways. Uh, but if we get something that goes into the lower lungs again, then yes, we could see some really nasty stuff happening. Uh, but again, I do think the T-cell immunity will probably protect there. The other concern I have is just that another coronavirus or another completely separate virus, Nipah virus, whatever, uh, comes out. It's important to remember uh, in the last 30 years, we actually 20 years, we have basically dealt with three coronavirus outbreaks. There was the original SARS that fortunately was not that transmissible outside of hospital settings and was contained at the global level and essentially eradicated, largely because it, it struck initially in Asia and Asian countries aren't stupid. They basically stepped up and took the appropriate precautions basically to stamp the damn thing out. I mean, I was in Thailand at the time of the original mm -hmm. SARS uh, outbreak, and I can tell you there was actually one of the workshops we were holding, there was a requirement that every person from a SARS country who came into Thailand had to be checked by a doctor every 24 hours. And so they were watching them, they were monitoring their temperatures, making sure that, you know, nothing would happen, and they did stamp it out. Uh, the second one that we deal with on a fairly routine basis right now is MERS, uh, which basically comes out of camels. It is still a problem in the Middle East. It pops up every so often, and, you know, it's one of the things they worry about with the Hajj, for example, because there is the possibility of a MERS epidemic arising out of that. Uh, South Korea dealt with a MERS epidemic, but again, they stamped it out because they took the appropriate measures and they dealt with it. You know, I think the thing is we could do much better on these things if we actually took the appropriate measures early on. You know, part of the reason why I think SARS-CoV-2 has been so disastrous is because very few countries took the appropriate measures earlier on. We did the lockdowns and then we basically threw caution to the wind. And most of Asia, where they continued to wear a mask most of the time, uh, we didn't see that much death, we didn't see that much you know, fatality associated with this particular virus until 
the new, much more infectious variants came out, and then those started doing a lot of damage. But had the entire globe taken that approach, the evolution would have been much slower. And so the development of these new infectious variants probably would have occurred at a much, much slower rate. We might still be back looking at something with a delta level of infectivity instead of an Omicron level of infectivity. So I do think that, you know, the, the failure to take appropriate measures on a global scale to try to arrest the spread of this early on, I think, was a major mistake. And it really gave the virus an advantage in dealing with it. To, uh, if I could add on to the, please, the question please. of of you know response response so <clears throat> there's so much that an individual can do but clearly um there's government responses that are necessary as well so you know if you think about inflation inflation is the result of millions of pricing decisions where people happen to be deciding to raise the prices at the same time and but the we do not hear anybody saying that the solution to inflation is personal responsibility all right <laughs> Um, so, but but uh, similarly, pandemic is is millions and billions of individual interactions that infect one to the other, and personal responsibility it ha uh, can't be uh, generated by a single person on a mass scale. That's what you need government for. And so, if the people, I mean, so right now, clearly in the United States, I, I don't know about elsewhere, but. I think a lot of other countries, uh, we're in a, a state of mass denial about the continuation of the pandemic. You know, people are believing in their mind the pandemic is over. This is denied. It denies the facts, uh, the data of, the, of, the, of what's going on. And that, that belief is undermining our response, okay, uh, at every level. And so what happens when, when the people are not doing the right thing and the government is not doing the right thing, that's where uh, people um, like Mel and Charlie and, uh, and others uh, voluntarily try to intervene and uh, send out, try to communicate that something needs to be done that's not being done. In other words, activism, okay? And I wanna point, point out there are activist groups in Hawaii trying to um, uh, educate people about the pandemic and intervene to cre create awareness. There's one particular one, it's called, called the uh, Hawaii Ambassadors for Community Education. It's on Facebook. And they are trying to get the schools in particular to get better ventilation. And uh, so I would encourage people to check that out. But you know, you have to get organized. and how many people can get organized on a volunteer basis to try to intervene when the government and the, and the society are not doing the right thing, that depends on the society and the culture. And um, so there are various people trying to perturb us out of this state of mass denial. And it's obviously not succeeded on a large scale, but at least uh, like shows like this, I would, I would consider as activism educating people uh, that want to hear uh, what's not what they're not getting from the government and the, the media and um, their friends. And uh, so this is, in a sense, an intervention into the information landscape to try to get a better response. So uh, that, that would be my encouragement is protect yourself and also join with others to try to get a better uh, grip of, of reality in the mass population. And I, I would add to that also, I think, you know, push for a safer workplace. You know, push on your push on your workplaces basically to improve their ventilation or to provide HEPA filters. You know, at East West Center, anybody who wants one can get a HEPA filter put in their office. Hmm. We've already increased the, the level of the filters within our ventilation system. So, you know, little steps like that will make a safer workplace. And you know, some of that can just be kind of local activism within the workplace itself. If enough people complain, then you know maybe your bosses will do something about it. I mean, at the University of Hawaii, uh, you know, everybody learned about these remote kind of uh, gatherings on Zoom and these other platforms. But now uh, a lot of the talks are going back to in-person only. Okay, so here we are 
with, with a positivity rate greater than 80% of the days of the pandemic. And there's no remote option anymore um, in a lot of situations. I think that's being in denial about the presence of, co of coronavirus. Well, my fundamental approach is I boycott in person only talks. There is no reason in this day and age that any talk should not all be done in a hybrid format. So yeah, people who want to be in the room, fine, let them be in the room, but it should be available in Zoom as well. I mean, at East West Center, all of our conference rooms basically are set up to handle Zoom. Mm. So there's absolutely no reason not to teleconference things as well. And I think that should be the norm in every workplace because we should not be encouraging older people to put themselves in a room with 30 or 40 other people right now. Because, you know, right now, like I say, we've got 160 cases a day that we know of that are showing up, which realistically means we're probably close to 1,000 cases a day evolving, you know, developing within Hawaii. And that means, you know, your chances of running into somebody in one of those crowded meeting rooms <laughs> who has COVID is pretty high. And so I see no reason to expose myself to that risk. Or, or in the elevator or stairwell that leads up to that room. Well, and that infuriate, you know, like I say, yeah. I mean, nothing uh, <laughs> pisses, uh, you know, pisses me I, off more than assholes <laughs> who get into an elevator coughing their damn heads off. I, I, I get out of know, the elevator if that happens. Th there there was a time where, the <laughs> there was a time where, you know, not long ago where, you know, if you coughed or sneezed, everybody looked at you like, what the heck, man, you should be home. And now it, it just let her rip. <laughs> I wish we were still doing that, to tell you the truth. Ostracizing. I, 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 yeah, I just, I mean, in the airplane coming back, well, actually going and coming back from Oregon, man, it's like, ugh, you can hear them. And it's just, I never, you know, it's, it's wow. horrible. But, yeah. Well, I've got to do a flight soon, and I'm actually planning to take JAL because they still have a masking requirement and all. Wow. Things. Yeah. Uh, I mean, to I was me, that's, to... that's the intelligent airline to take right now. I was surprised to see how many uh, of the flight attendants uh, are not wearing masks, um, hmm. which is quite interesting. I, I don't know. I, I, <laughs> I'd be wearing a mask if I was a flight attendant. I would. Uh, I would. I would not want to take. And you know, again, and I. It's not about me. It's about my mother-in-law. It's about the other elderly people or uh, immunocompromised people that I, I may come in contact with, and I could be. Uh, asymptomatic and th that's what I think about and it's amazing how three years ago everyone thought about that every single person living breathing human being on this in this state and in this country was concerned about possibly giving this to someone that you could kill them and that is no longer a concern for a lot of people because they honestly believe number one a, a, a chunk of those people believe that the pandemic is over and the, and the other bunch believes that it's not severe right it's minor and if i get it it's like the cold tylenol uh stay home for a couple of days and i will be fine and well, I, that's I think that's the problem mel is we have this misinformation being promoted by some of our public health officials and that level of misinformation basically leads people to make bad decisions you know i mean one of the things i often use in trying to encourage young people to get vaccinated is to point out that those who are vaccinated are less likely to transmit COVID to others. There's actually a very interesting study that came out of the California prison system uh, that was just published last week. And basically it showed that if you had even one dose of vaccine, you were 20% less likely to transmit COVID onto close contacts. In this case, it means people in the same jail cells. Uh, so and that's you know about as close a contact as you get. So that was reduced by 20%. So if you took that and you added on masking and a couple of other things, you'd really radically reduce transmission, for example, within the home or within the workplace. And if you had a vaccine and you also had a previous infection, the transmission was down 40%. Okay, So even young people getting vaccines has an impact on community transmission. We don't hear anybody talking about that. We really ought to be promoting that as one of the reasons to get young people to get vaccinated rather than Rather than, I mean, you know, I think state we've got something like a 20% vaccine booster, you know, uh, bivalent booster rate among young people. It's pathetically low. And even among the oldest, the bivalent booster rate is only 50% among those 75 and older. Hmm. And that's insane. Those people are at high risk if they get a breakthrough infection. Why are they not getting vaccinated? That's just insipid. There's no excuse for it. 
Well, Docs, I appreciate you guys so much. Uh, I know we went past our time, but I appreciate the information. And, uh, you know, I, I, I think the timing was right. It's been a long time since you folks were on, uh, but it's pretty much been status quo uh, with the new variants that are popping up with what's happening across the, the country uh, and other countries. I think we gotta we gotta start ramping up the information again so we can educate our people so they don't you know if they get the right information and they they can make a better choice and I, I think from a lot of the comments that I saw tonight uh, some some of these uh, our villagers have heard this information on the new variant for the first time uh, and and that is just how it is I had just in fact heard about this variant this week actually it was just mm. very recently and um, and I'm almost embarrassed to admit that because I'm usually on all of these things. I've been quite busy, but uh, and, and that's the whole purpose of the show is to get the information out to the people so they can make right choices and well, share I think, with you know, their friends. Part of the problem, though, Mel, is that, for example, CDC has known about XBB15 for over a month at this point. In fact, anything, any variant that was over 1% was supposed to show up on their charts. But XBB15 passed the 1% margin back uh, late November, I believe. So it actually should have been on the charts from then. Instead, it only showed up like two weeks ago. And so I'm not going to say they're deliberately hiding things, but they're certainly not doing their job in terms of getting information out to the public. I've only seen Ashish Jha, the White House response coordinator, uh, discussing XBB15 this week. He, he put out some tweets earlier this week warning people, yeah, this is coming and you ought to be worried about it, but... Again, you know, if you're, if you're not following him on Twitter, you probably haven't heard that because I certainly haven't heard that much in the mainstream media in terms of, you know, warning people that XBB15 is coming. We're starting to see the articles now, but, you know, they should have been coming out a month ago. Twitter is my one of my best friends. Uh, in fact, it's probably where I found out about the BB15 yeah. is from Twitter. Uh, Me too. And. Yeah, it's... And, you know, people, I, people have been following it there for the last six weeks, basically. Wow. And, you know, and actually putting out case counts in different countries and showing and, you know, showing what's been happening in New York and Massachusetts and Connecticut. So, you know, I mean, there's there's a lot of very useful information that shows up there if you know who to follow. But there's also, unfortunately, a lot of really bad misinformation. Oh, yeah. On Twitter. That, so that, that, I know that as well. <laughs> you got to know the right people to follow. <laughs> Well, guys, I, I want to thank you guys again. Uh, apologize for keeping you guys so late. Uh, to our villagers, thank you for hanging out, and I hope you guys enjoyed the show tonight. We definitely will have these two gentlemen. I, I, I don't want to. I don't want to jinx it, so I'm not going to say <laughs> it. But um, <laughs> uh, I, I definitely appreciate having the opportunity to, to have you guys on uh, to share information that is credible, and uh, very informative. So thank you all. Thank you so much, man. I appreciate Mel, you guys. Mel, I would love it if the next time we are on is to celebrate the end of the pandemic where we all drink our champagne with each other, but uh, um, I don't think that's going to be happening for a while. Well, you know, we <laughs> we promised the party, and I know this is how I know. Even some of our villagers, and I, I mean no disrespect, I'm not sure, I can't remember who, who, I, who, I, who I saw it from, but, you know, Charlie and I, promised the party when this pandemic was over <laughs> on Kauai. We did the concert, the free concert with the Luau and, and, and we have not forgotten that, but the reality is the pandemic is not over and that party will happen when these two guys right here on the screen <laughs> tells me that the pandemic is over. <laughs> not when president Biden tells me it's over. Not when anyone else tells me over uh, that it's over. It's when these two guys can both agree that the pandemic is over and then uncle charlie and myself will will have that concert on kawaii so no I would, pressure I just, guys as my final word i just for anybody who's a fan of history to realize this is a really uh, uh, notable moment in history now that the population has this mass denial uh, uh reaction you know, this it's it's really uh, you don't see this that many times, but I think it's important to realize, you know, to see firsthand how our collective intelligence is failing to work and failing to deal with the reality. 
because that, that's what gets people into deep trouble in the whole societies. And, you know, any, any ideas about how to improve our collective intelligence are really crucial. But, but right now, just observe this, note this, record this, because this is history being made. Well, following on Dr. Alterbrew's comment there, I want to say that, you know, I think a huge part of the problem here is that this virus got so politicized early on, certainly here in the United States and to a great extent in other countries as well, uh, outside of Asia. And Asia wasn't politicized so much, except in India. And pretty much the countries dealt with it fairly well until it became so contagious that, you know, it started to break through a lot of the protections we had. Uh, and I do think that that was a real failure of public health leadership. Because I do think we could have, with appropriate messaging right from the start, without denial about it being airborne, without telling people not to use masks and so on and so forth, had CDC and WHO taken an appropriate approach from the start, and had we talked about how the public needed to consider that when we reached periods of high transmission in the community, then people would have to consider masking at that point, and we'd really encourage them to do it, you know, and, and provide free masks for them and make it very easy for them. I think had we taken that approach, we could have moved toward a norm that is much more like the norms in Asia, where when respiratory stuff is spreading around, people use masks because they recognize that that's an important public health measure and it helps to protect them and it helps to protect the person next to them. And I think had we taken that approach from the start here, of this anti-mask, anti-vax, anti-everything sort of approach that consumed U.S. and U.K. politics, I think we'd be in a much, much better, much, much better shape overall. So, you know, we really mishandled this from day one, and that's a real problem. And that is, it's at the feet of our politicians and our public health, quote, leaders, unquote. Because I do not consider them to be leaders, I consider them to be followers who are following their political masters and not actually responding to actual public health needs yeah the plain and simple answer to that is that the politicians should not be leading the fight in a in a medical or or an issue that involves medical uh, uh public health that they just should not they, they should hand over the reins to the experts whether it's you know wh whoever it is whether it's it locally the department of health or and allow them to do their job with no fear of any type of retribution or no no political influence and just let the let the medical experts be the 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 temporary policy makers so we can nip this in the bud and prevent what we re, what we had could have been prevented if the medical experts had taken over early on and I'm speaking for Hawaii, not not for the country, but I'm assuming it's a, it, it. I'm sure it applies across the board. But we we allowed politicians to make decisions uh, on our health, um, and and that was I think where we made a mistake, big mistake. But hopefully we we learn. Hopefully, like you said, when the when the history books are written, and you know the the next time around, uh, those leaders at that time will make the right decisions. So. With that, folks, thank you again. Uh, Docs, thank you, you guys. Too. Enjoy the enjoy the weekend. Stay safe. And our villagers, we'll see you guys next week. I don't know who's going to be on yet. have no clue, but <laughs> I'll figure it out. Uh, but you guys stay safe over the weekend. Take care. God bless. We love you guys. Mahalo. Uh,